Hey there, I'm Scott Winfield and welcome to Victorian Opera's web series, Artists in Isolation. On this episode, we're thrilled to be joined by acclaimed Australian director, Roger Hodgman. Roger, thank you so, so much for joining us. It's, it's a pleasure. It's good to talk to somebody. <laughs> I haven't talked to many people, except on Zoom meetings, of which I've had endless. Now, firstly, I wanted to touch on The Who's Tommy, which you're directing for Victorian Opera, which uh, of course has been rescheduled to 2021. Was that somewhat a relief? Um, well, I think a relief in the sense that I think for some time we knew it was just not going to be possible to um, yes. get the kind of audience we we wouldn't be allowed to get the audience numbers that we need. And it's a sort of show because it's such a, it's a rock. It was started off yes. as a rock, rock sort of concert album, really. And has a, you really want a lot of people there. And then, and of course, the Palais is a perfect place for it. has a rock and roll connection. So in that sense, it was a relief. Um, there was the uncertainty leading up to it for a while where we thought, oh, maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. But um, I think what's wonderful is the opera's decided to program it for next year. I know all the cast and the creatives are so grateful for that. And in fact, there have been endless comments on Facebook about um, how great the, the opera is committed to that so quickly. And um, so people are disappointed and sad, but um, still excited. But it's, it's meant the last few weeks been a bit odd, sort of wondering whether to prepare for it or not. And um, uh, we've been having lots of meetings about the design and the budgets and so forth. But um, the more creative um, thinking about how to stage it, I've sort of put on hold. So, um, Indeed. So I've got something to do next year. As a massive Who fan yourself, what are you most excited about sort of tackling this project? It wasn't absolutely groundbreaking um, album when it first came out. I think the New York Times described it as the first um, rock masterpiece. Um, and it captured the imagination of, a, of, a, of that generation. Younger people don't know it, very often don't know it. It was amazing and quite exciting for the audition. So many young people, because a lot of the cast is quite young, coming in and saying, I didn't know this music. Isn't it amazing? You know, um, it's had, it has had, after it was first released, it used to be, performed, there were orchestral versions, there were several opera houses that staged it as a concert, not as a... Not as a I know that Seattle, Seattle Opera did it, um, I believe in the 70s, and Bette Midler played the Acid Queen. Fantastic. And I know it was done in Europe the same way. And then there was that very eccentric, um, at the time, extraordinarily successful film by Ken Russell, which when you look at it now, it's pretty mad and very much of its time, but uh, still had, you know, you've got Tina Turner singing... Asset Queen, you've got Elton John doing, um, you know, Pinball Wizard, you've got uh, all sorts of extraordinary people in it, and, and Roger Daltrey, obviously, as well. But it was pretty eccentric and changed the story from the original um, concept um, album. And then in the 90s, um, Townsend got together with um, a Canadian-American director called Des McEnough, and they rewrote the, rewrote the story and got a tidied it up and made sense of it. He wrote one or two new songs for it. Um, and then it was done in Broadway in the mid-90s to great success. I think it won several Tonys and so forth. And in fact, they were going to revive it this year in the next next month or something, but um, that's obviously put, been put on hold. So it's great. And people say, oh, I haven't seen that for ages. Well, I've never seen it. It's never been done in Australia, this version. Um, there have been many concert versions done by all sorts of people. But this is... Um, this is a different show. It's the same music and all the great songs are in it. Anyone wants to, you know, is looking forward to the, you know, all those wonderful songs, we'll, we'll see them. Sunrise, an extraordinary, an extraordinary cast we've got. Now, Roger, I'd love to know, where, where are you self-isolating in the world? We're in Tasmania. Um, Pamela and I bought this place south of Hobart about five years ago. I, I come from Tasmania. I always swore I'd never come back. What changed your mind? Pamela loves it, and we've been coming down regularly just for holidays and things. And gradually, I came to realise that I do have connections here, and it is the most beautiful place in the world. We're down on the Dontercaster Channel, looking out at Bruny Island. It's really beautiful. It's quite isolated. No one's we're 150 metres away from the nearest building, um, and we've got a great view, and it's great for music and reading and so forth. So we've been coming down. We still basically live in Melbourne, but we've been coming down as often as we can. Whenever we're not working, we come down, sometimes just for a weekend. 
And then when um, I was in the middle of doing some television uh, work and suddenly this all blew up, I mean, I predicted it early on. I'd said to my first assistant director, I, I bet you now we don't actually get to shoot the, our episodes. And two days before I would start the shoot, I'd just done all the pre-production. We, we were finally shut down. So we leapt in a um, – the show, by the way, is Wentworth, which is a – Foxtel drama, which is not not everybody in Australia knows it because it's on Foxtel and they don't have Foxtel, but it's a worldwide phenomenon. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I think it's pretty ama- one of the most amazing. Well, many people have said it's the best TV drama Australia's ever made. I would agree. In terms of the world response, it's extraordinary. It's in, um, you know, Pamela gets fan mail from endless different countries, you know, lots of Russians and Mexico and you all over Spanish, all over the place, um, and I think it's I think it's well over a hundred countries it's shown in. Um, anyway, I was just got through my pre-production. We're about to um, start filming, and this happened, so we just leapt on a plane and as quickly as we could and got here. Um, pretty scary um, on the plane. You know, everyone looking nervously at anyone who coughed because Tasmania has quite strong, good on them, um, lockdown conditions. So we had to go into um, compulsory isolation for two weeks, but we were allowed to do it in our house. Subsequently, they changed that to isolating people in fairly horrible hotels. So I was really glad to be, we are really lucky to be able to come to our own place. We'd put in an order at our favourite food shop and click and collect it as we came through. I ordered some wine to be delivered, not that we needed some, we had some already, but nervous we might run out. Um, and so the first two weeks, we couldn't really leave the property. Um, we just tentatively walked out down the road and back a couple of times. Uh, we had some really nice neighbours who would drop in vegetables or offer to go and get milk and bread for us. And we had, you know, it was, it was strange but quite quite peaceful time, really. And then since then, we've basically stayed here. Um, I haven't had, I haven't talked face-to-face to anybody, I don't think, since we've been here, apart from the odd shop. Um, but we go out now most days to for a walk. There you are know, a lot of quite nice, quite nice beaches nearby and we tend to go and, walk along one of those or a lot of nature trails or um you know reserves and things so we've been exploring a whole lot of these walks that we've never seen before which have been fun listening to a lot of music um reading a bit doing a bit of things you know cataloging things doing the tax not much fun but it's good to get it done absolutely yes one of the things about a director is that a lot of your time and for me the most um almost the most pleasurable time. It's not in the rehearsal room or in the theatre, but doing all the preparation for it. So at least I've had, I've been able to do some more prep on the Wentworth when I go back. I'll probably be, I'll be better prepared than ever, which probably means it'll be not as good as usual because um, I tend to work best spontaneously. Does this allow you time to sort of forward plan more episodes ahead than you were already? Well, no, I'm only doing the two episodes, so I, but it's allowed me to go yes. into more detail with the planning. Um, and modified to some extent because when we do go back, which is quite soon, I think, with, we're talking about a couple of weeks away, um, we go back under certain conditions, you know, trying to maintain social distance where we can. Well, if you've seen Wentworth, you know that's impossible um, for much of the time. The tension would be very different on the show from 1.5 megahertz. You could not, you could not make the show. Um, but, you know, where we can, we can do that. And um, there's endless, and we've had lots of meetings about this, lots of documents, there's endless um, preparations for the crew to be separated, you know, everything to be wiped down and washed and sanitised all the time, props being handed over in plastic bags rather than you know, to the actor before this thing, um, fewer people on the set, very, very comprehensive um, um, protocols which we'll have to uh, abide by, which is great. And um, so it's going to be, I'm this kind of guinea pig. I think we're the uh, Neighbours has gone back. But I don't think anywhere else in the world really has gone back with anything remotely like a drama like this. And so we're a bit of a guinea pig, really, to see what we can get away with. The rule is, is you know, social distancing, we're practical and we're following that. So where it is practical, we'll do it. And when it's not, we, we won't. Actors are very relaxed about it. Um, there's always that just terrible fear that if somebody gets it, we'll all be in isolation again, you know. Well, it seems from what you've described, those processes sound very necessary given the stakes involved that you do return to shoot to then shut down. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it would be disastrous. And um, I mean, luckily, I mean, Australia's done very, very well and there's very little of the disease around. So everyone's feeling fairly confident, but have to take as many precautions. And the other thing, I, I, 
like most directors, you've always got a few things on the boil. So I've got a couple of projects from the future that I've been working on and it's been great to have the time to do that. One is a, a musical written by Kurt Cansley, who was in Ragtime and um, and um, Evita recently, who lives in England, but his writing partner, who's an American uh, actor-singer living in England, have written several musicals. Now we're developing a new one based on Jackson Pollock with Joe Kindamo, a Melbourne, wonderful Melbourne jazz pianist doing the orchestrations. And um, so I've been working on that script with them remotely. And then, for example, on Friday, um, there's a reading of it in London, which I'll be present at because of the zoo. And then as a film script I've been working on, well, actually I've been working on for decades almost, um, it was a film script by a Tasmanian friend of mine set in Tasmania that we nearly got financed um, several years ago, just before the global financial crisis. And then that stopped it. And we thought of more or less giving it up. And then on a whim, I showed it to um, a TV producer friend of mine, Amanda Higgs, who is the, was the original producer of uh, Secret Life of Us, which is where I really started my television. And uh, as I've been working with recently on a TV series called Mustangs FC, which is a great series about a group of teenage girls who get together and get a, start their own soccer team and beat the boys, basically. And she loved it, so we've been working on that. She came down just before this lockdown, and we toured around the area looking at locations, and since then we've had a few... Luckily timed. Just in time. So at least I've got things to keep on working on, and I'll, you know, I'll have Tommy as well. Because that's... I get... I get uh, I'm not saying I'm a workaholic, but I'm not very good if I haven't got something to work on. Um, I don't need to work eight hours a day, if necessary. I could, as long as I've got something to work on, I'm fine. But uh, I don't know how I'd cope if I had nothing to work on. I, I was going to ask how this abundance of time had changed your life, but it very much seems that you've you maintained a sort of a very busy schedule. Yeah, but not as busy. You know, it's not like I'm working all day or anything. I mean, a lot of relaxing, a lot of listening to music, having afternoon naps, um, cooking. We've sort of we've both both of us love cooking. I, I tend to do most of it, but but Pam is probably a better cook than me. What have you been cooking? Well, we've been having fun sort of experimenting with things we don't normally do. There's a fantastic um, organic vegetable grower who lives fairly close who on Wednesday and Saturday mornings puts stuff out on her little stall at the bottom of her um, um, property. With a, a little honour system? Yeah, an honour system, although she usually wanders out to have a chat. And um, she grow, uh, she supplies all the main restaurants in, in, in Hobart, but of course they're not operating much at the moment um and she specializes in really weird things so you go there and you think oh there's a bunch mm. of nettles what can we do with that so we make nettle risotto or there's some portuguese okay. cabbage so we made caldo de verde which is a portuguese um cabbage soup and she had something last week there was some ricotto chilies which i would never heard of which are very hot uh, big round peruvian chilies and some very strange mm. vegetable fruit i'm not sure what could yakon yakan yakon absolutely amazing flavour. It looked like a little sort of, like a, um, a twig really, really woody, and you sort of scrape it off and peel it down. There's this really amazing th thing in the middle. So we, we last night we had a Portuguese, uh, uh, a Peruvian meal. I've never, uh, I knew nothing about Peruvian cooking, but we looked up a few recipes and had, had it. So it's having fun experimenting with stuff which you wouldn't normally have time to do. What a wonderful neighbour to have. Yes, yes. She's a, when I say neighbour, she's about 20, 25 miles away. Lovely woman. She's quite well known. She used to have a monthly column in the Gourmet Traveller, in fact. And she's she's famous for, A, the quality of her stuff. You know, the most beautiful tomatoes or tiny carrots or... But there's always something unusual that you've never heard of before. And the other thing, we've been buying a fair bit of fresh fish because Tasmania has some of the best seafood around, but most of the best stuff goes to China or Japan or... The rest of the restaurants in Sydney. So suddenly, all these fishermen have been um, needing to um, sell their um, product. For example, one of the big crayfish rock lobster guys has been taking a little truck around various places and serving um, crayfish and chips everywhere. We have, haven't had that, but as you drive up the road, there's quite often a sign saying "fresh tuna." That seems like a must to add in some point before you return back to filming. Absolutely, and. Um, um, there's a just down the Kettering Wharf. There's a, there's a fisherman who comes in every few every week or so, and we get a text message saying, "11 o'clock, um, albacore tuna and flathead or something." And we arrive and the boat's just 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 pulling in. And there's 
cleaning the fish on the uh, deck. So it's could hardly be fresher. So oh, that's wonderful. Been, well, I was, I was about to say, you couldn't, you couldn't ask for fresher seafood. No, no. And so our plans, we might be planning something for that evening, but suddenly we see that same thing. Okay, no, that's what we're going to have tonight. So that's been fun. Normally you don't have that. Although, as I say, we always enjoy cooking. And I find, even when I'm working, I, quite, I find cooking a kind of relaxing thing to do when I come home to sort of wind down. But you, you have to do things fairly straightforward and simple otherwise. So having the time to do something a bit more elaborate has been fun. It sounds like your home life and sort of the surrounds uh, are bringing you great joy at this time. The frustrating thing is it's not knowing what, how long was this going to happen. It's been um, the hard thing. I think the fact that we both, both of us work in the theatre and in television, but the fact that we're going back to a big chunk of television work has been a great relief because we've got some work. Most of people, our friends who are working in the theatre have nothing. And it is absolutely terrible because, yes. and theatre is going to be the last. The restaurants are going to be opening up again soon, albeit under certain conditions and smaller numbers. But the theatre is, you know, I don't think it's going to open up properly for a long time, and it's tragic. And of course, we've got a government that seems to be not interested in that at the moment. It's a challenging road ahead. Yeah, and the arts are so important, and. Um, Theatre is, live theatre is so important. I mean, I, I applaud all these efforts that everybody is doing, putting stuff online, um, but it's not the same. You, you can't watch National Theatre Live and think, oh, I've seen a show at the National Theatre. You haven't. You've seen a, rec- you know, a historical recording of it, but it's, the experience is different. I mean, I've seen a few of those National Theatre Live things where I've seen the, show, the same shows live in London, and then you see yes. it on television, and it's not, it's not remotely the same. I mean, I'm great. it's great that they're doing it, don't get me wrong, but, and what I do hope is that no one's going to say, oh, well, that's, that's the way we should watch theatre in the future, because uh, it's that experience of being in a live audience and feeling the person beside you breathe and laugh and gasp at the same time as you are, that actually, and that relationship between somebody live on stage and somebody live watching yes. is um, unique. I would love to reflect on your work as a director, because I, I can think of a few others who have seamlessly worked across theatre, um, television, opera and musicals. I mean, not many people do it and it's, I don't quite know why it's, I've been lucky. I've just been very lucky, I think. I mean, I, obviously I can't be terrible at it or I wouldn't keep getting work, but but a lot of it's luck, just being in the right place at the right time. And somebody, take, you know, Richard Gill, funny, I'm saying, come and do a handle opera for us. Well, actually before that, um, Lindy Hume running um, Oz Opera, phoning me up, I was in Brisbane, do, you know, in Perth doing a play and walking to work and she phoned me up and said, do you want to do um, Oz Opera's Rigoletto? And I'd never done an opera, although I liked opera. And, you know, it's, it's people taking chances off you and then if you don't completely mess it up, you get more chances. It must be incredibly enriching to lead such a diverse career. I have to say, as an audience member, I love your take on comedies. Um, your production of Don Pasquale and your production of Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, particularly when you staged it in Sydney as a full production, were absolutely hilarious. I love I love comedy. I'm not. I don't think people who know me would say I'm a particularly hilarious person, but I actually love doing comedy. It, it's the science of comedy that I love. Yes, totally. You take one more second before you say this line, or. Um, look at somebody at that particular moment it's funny and if you don't it's not and what the mystery of it is endlessly entertaining but i think i have a quite a developed sense of ridiculous i love i mean a lot of don pasquale was absolutely ridiculous and magically so oh great thank thank you for saying that it was such fun we did it first in tokyo and in sydney then melbourne um and dirty world of scoundrels is i think a wonderful piece it's such a um I think it's far funnier than the film, to be honest, although I know everybody adores the film. Um, and the music, Yazbek's music is so contemporary and um, muscular and and witty, and his lyrics are fabulous. Well, there's so much humour to it. Yeah, yeah, he's such a, such a wit. He's an interesting character. He, he was quite a well-known comedy writer, writing for Saturday Night Live, and a very highly respected with many recordings, um, jazz rock singer composer um, always hated um, musicals and then a friend of his um, was supposed to do, do the music for for Monty and it was somebody he, he was in a band with funny enough, and couldn't do it for some reason said to him oh you should do it 
So he did and discovered he loved musical so since, since then he, he went out and got the rights for Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, which was his second one. And then he's done a couple since then. Um, um, Woman on Virgin Nervous Breakdown, which nearly is good, but isn't quite, doesn't quite work. And then um, lately a fantastic piece called The Band's Visit, which is just hilarious. And I hope we'll come to Australia eventually. I'm curious to know, reflecting on your body of work, what are your proudest achievements? Oh, it's hard to say, really. I think when I was in Canada, I think my proudest achievement or my most unusual and enjoyable achievements was working with Tennessee Williams a couple of times towards the end of his of life course. on two new productions, one of which I'd commissioned, which was an adaptation of The Seagull, which wasn't wow. very successful, but um, but just being in a room with him for four or five weeks was pretty extraordinary, plus all the stuff beforehand. I wanted to ask you, you know, as you know, you're married to celebrated a- actress Pamela Rabe. How would you describe your household and how, how have you guys been sort of um, existing at the moment in a creative way? Well, we, we both talk to each other a bit about our work um, when we're working on, on other things and bounce ideas off. But basically... Not a lot. We're not obsessive about it. I, when we're working together, um, we have very, which we've done from time to time in the theatre, only once on television, but now we're about to do a much bigger um, thing with Wentworth. Um, we have a very strict rule that we don't talk about it at home, because uh, otherwise you go in the next day having decided something which the other mm. was not party to. So then we stretch that to be talking about it in the car going home after rehearsals which has led to a few very long car, very roundabout trips. Um, but um, we have a very strong rule, rule about not talking. And if one of us says to, oh, I've got an idea about that, the other one will say, no, wait till we get into the rehearsal room tomorrow. A very sensible approach. I'm also one of those directors, that, um, and I'm not, I don't think this is an admirable thing at all. I think, you know, different people have different ways of working. But when I leave the rehearsal room and go home, I just want to forget about it. I like to have a glass of wine, perhaps watch a bit of telly, um, cook something and not think about it. And I quite often find, sometimes this doesn't work, but quite often find if there have been problems that I was had been wrestling with, um, I quite often find if the problems I've been wrestling with, um, they'll be solved in the morning. You know, that somehow the brain keeps working overnight and you wake up the next morning. So I'm not good at talking about stuff, I'm not, or working at home in, in after the rehearsals. I tend to I do a lot of work before rehearsal start, not always in planning the physical detail, but just trying to work out what the scenes are about and re- doing research around the, the piece because I quite like being fairly spontaneous, particularly in theatre. You can't be as spontaneous in television. Um, but I, I, I'm not obsessive when I get home. I like to wipe the set clean and think of other things for a little while, and I find that works for me. Roger, as our final question... Um... I'd love to know what's the first thing that you'd like to do once this once this time passes. Um, well, I'd like to get back in a rehearsal room or or on a set. Yes. And in fact, I'm going to be on a set in about three weeks, I think. But but particularly when the thing passes properly, um, back in a rehearsal room with, room with some actors and in a theatre with a lot of people watching something entertaining and um, I don't necessarily mean funny, but sort of some big show with a large audience would be good uh you know going back to some restaurants without having to think about um sanitizing one's hands all the time and stuff would be good but um i think particularly and the thing that worries me most about it i think the last thing to come back in the arts will be um big theater events and that's um, what i'm really looking forward to sitting in a yeah, with 1,500 people watching something exciting, an opera or a musical or a play. Absolutely. I, I, I think I think we can all, all, all speak to that as well. Um, Roger, it's been so lovely to chat and enjoy your wonderful Tasmanian lifestyle and fresh produce and seafood. Um, and please stay safe. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. For more chats with artists in isolation, you can follow Victorian Opera across social media or visit victorianopera.com.au. I'm Scott Winfield. Thanks for watching. <laughs>